this is the first comment I believe that Kexi made when they came into the chat. The Bible says women should not preach or teach to men. Yet this chick, meaning you, Mary, is teaching men and misleading people about Islam. You're disobeying the Bible and the Quran. I'll, 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 let, you, I'll let you get started with that. I'm going to uh, run to the restroom real quick, and then I'll be back. Okay, well, I have the advantage because I've never been on screen. So nobody knows what I feed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it never says that... Women are not to preach or teach to men in the Bible. What it says is that they are not supposed to usurp authority. And they are not, that I am not the pastor of a church. I don't have pastoral authority over men. And most especially my husband. Because in, in the context here, it's about uh, women in a congregation who are like, yelling uh, and disrupting the congregation as it's going on. If you look at the way that uh, uh, Paul consistently uses the word silence, he doesn't ever use it to mean people do not talk. What it means is end all quarreling, end all division, end disagreement. Those who need to be silenced are always the people who are arguing unrighteously without exception. And so those who are um, and and it is, doesn't just talk about women. It talks about all kinds of people who need to be silenced and need. Uh, it's always about their arguments need to be shut down and not listened to and not uh, not indulged in. Now, in the it's so funny because people always run to certain passages, but a lot of times they don't even know the context of the passages they're running to. For example. They'll run to the part about the woman needing to wear a, the wife specifically, because it's only about married women needing to wear a head covering in church. A head covering was at that time a symbol of a free woman who is a wife. So slaves, slave girls, even if they were married, were not allowed to wear uh, head coverings and unmarried girls didn't wear head coverings. So it wasn't about like not being sexy because obviously the most attractive people would be the young women who aren't yet married. Instead, it's about, um, it, women were coming into the church and since you will not be married in in the new heaven and new earth they were pulling off their headscarves then which was the equivalent of like taking off your wedding ring and so they're being told that no that's shameful to act like you're taking off your wedding ring to come into the house of god that's that's not cool and in the context there it's about women praying with their heads covered meaning that they are having a position whereby their voices are being heard there in the group setting in a uh an authoritative position because they were leading a prayer um prayers were not all recited together there were answers and responses and things like that because people a lot of them weren't literate you couldn't have that kind of uh, complete recitation thing the way you have now. We don't have, didn't have projectors, didn't all have books to read from. And you also had situations where you had, uh, uh, there's also another place that's talking about prophesying and women prophesying and that being, guess what? Allowed in the church. The daughters of James prophesied where? In a church. When they came up to, uh, when they came up to Paul. So, there are uh no they weren't they weren't the ones who came up to paul they but they were prophesying in a church they weren't prophesying elsewhere so women were speaking it's about what role women take now in uh actually the quran doesn't say anything about that it's the ahadith that say that no leader can be a woman period and if you actually knew your quran you will know that the quran does not say that women can't give the Khutbah or whatever, um, but rather that all comes from the Ahadith. So, yeah, you can make up what you want, but we actually have examples of women teaching and preaching in the Bible. So we have the example of, uh, of uh, Priscilla, who taught 
uh, Apollos correctly, along with Aquila, her husband. Her name's listed first because she's doing most of the teaching. She was called a co-worker in Christ. A, num a number of the other women are addressed by, in Paul's letters, he has closings, and he would talk to people who are co-workers in Christ. Um, Paul sent Phoebe with his letter at one point, which means that she would be the one to read it in church because she was his official emissary, and she stood up and read her letter. Another uh, woman was called an apostle. That's a little a apostle, meaning a little a messenger as well, which means that she was another worker in Christ. So whenever he talks about women being workers in Christ, they were absolutely evangelists. So you can't say, Paul said, whenever <laughs> Paul actually talked about women being workers in Christ. Paul also, whenever uh, in, was it, uh, first... Is it First Timothy three or Second Timothy three? I think it's, I think it's first, but I'm not completely sure where it gives the uh, the roles of uh, the elder slash uh, overseer, which is the presbyter or priest and bishop, which was one role originally, and then it gives the role of deacon. The third role there is deaconess. All the ancient churches understood it as deaconess. A deaconess was not a female deacon. It's not exactly the same role. But a woman, it was a distinct role, but it was in a role of uh, authority. And in a number of cases, they were ordained specifically as deaconesses. They weren't just enrolled. They were specifically ordained, just as priests are ordained. Um, and all the churches had deaconesses, at least until the 900s. They fell out of favor and gradual denigration of the position of women in the church absolutely did happen. But all the early churches had deaconesses and they all had roles. They kept, uh, they kept, uh, they had authority over the women's side of the church. Um, early deaconesses actually cleaned the, uh, the uh, altar area because that was considered too special to let regular people in who could clean the rest of the building. Only an ordained person could. They would take care of the vestments and the altar cloths and things like that, whereas the deacons would take care of the plate metal and the other, the, the metal objects. So uh, they visited the poor and the sick in their homes. They helped in the baptism of women because people ba were baptized in very little clothing or naked back then. And so the women needed help without men looking at them so they had a very clear role within the church um they were very often widow the 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 widows who were enrolled as servants of the church were very often the same as the deaconesses because in ancient times if you were not a very rich woman you did not have time to do more than see over your own household that was all consuming when you had a lot of kids in a big household um and unless you had a ton of help so, uh, but they did have very clear roles and these were set up by Paul himself and they were observed by all the early church. Oh, sorry, excellent uh, teaching there. Um, Ellie raises a good point. Learning to recognize that I was reading the Bible with cherry picking style was a huge discovery for me. I think it's a great piece of help to point people to simple tips on how to read the Bible. And Kexi, uh, I've asked Kexi for some evidence uh, of their position. All they are, can do is assert they're right. You're showing biblical ignorance. Those verses are clear, yet you deny it. Well, Kexi, have you actually read First Timothy? Do you actually know what the context of those verses are? Or did you just find those three verses that you've quoted numerous times on a Muslim website and not even understand what the context is? As Mary pointed out, it's specifically the context of the requirements for a specific role in the church. And you're asserting that we are showing ignorance by telling you that, that fact. But if you actually read 1 Timothy, you'll see that those verses occur in the middle of verses telling people what the requirements are to be an elder in the church. And you're just asserting, oh, no, this, this is for all occasions at all time based on what? Your opinion? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous because it is talking about the whole thing is about what happens in the church. So, again, um, 
So, so a she, woman must learn in quietness and full submissiveness. So that means that you're not supposed to sit there and yell and quarrel. The the quietness is emphasized in a bunch of different places about, and there's also people who need to be silenced in other places who aren't even women. They're talking about men who are coming in and teaching uh, Alexander, the coppersmith, and other people who are leading people astray, being said they, saying that they, they need to be silenced and things like that. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over men. Here, right there, it's talking about in the church at that moment. So, that is, if you go to the next chapter, so that's First Timothy 2, right? Mm -hmm. What is not included in that? First Timothy 3, you have the qualifications for deacons. And first you have overseers slash elders. They were the same role at first and then they became distinct. Then you had qualifications for deacons in the same way the women, and the women is not actually in the, like, the whole thing isn't in the text, um, it's just, uh, the Greek is more elliptical. Must be dignified, not slanders, but temperate and faithful in all things. This means the women deaconesses. That's how it was understood by the entire church. So you are claiming that Paul, one chapter ago, these weren't even divided into chapters then, right? So like mm -hmm. a paragraph ago, essentially, and was he's talking about how people need to behave themselves in church. So I had urged that petitions, prayers, intersections, thanksgiving be offered for everyone so that we may live tranquil and quiet lives. This is good and pleasing to God. Um, for this is reason I was appointed as a preacher and apostle, faithful and true teacher of the Gentiles. I'm telling you the truth. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or dissension. There we go. So the men were having problems with anger and dissension in the church service, and the women were likewise misbehaving. Rather than anger, they were wearing showy clothes to make other people feel stupid and using it as a chance to show off. And they were quarreling as well and were arguing with their their husbands. Because again, this is uh, Adam was formed first and then Eve. It's the Adam and Eve in that family. Women were not overseers. They weren't elders. An overseer had to be the husband of one life, right? The mm. deacons, however, have a, there's a female counterpart role that not identical in the ancient church. I'm not saying that deaconesses were just deacons who happened to be female. It was a different, a distinct and different role. They had different duties. Only some of their duties overlapped. But you're saying that Paul meant to say that the women should not be deaconesses and we should not consider them at all no deaconesses. And he just accidentally said deaconesses. So I, I'm glad that you, that you have now corrected Paul and said that, that he misunderstood his own writing. So that's, that's very excellent there. Yeah, going back to the, the comment earlier on um, you know, how to properly understand the Bible. If your interpretation of 1 Timothy 2 contradicts Paul, then you probably are misinterpreting what he says. And in numerous places, as Mary has already alluded to multiple times, in numerous places in Paul's writings, he talks about women ministering, women prophesying, women teaching, women acting as apostles. So how do you square your opinion uh, of those verses that they're, they're perfectly clear and it's obviously about all women and all indications and First Timothy does not speak of the church. I've asked Kexi multiple times in the chat to, to say whether or not they've read First Timothy 2. They haven't answered, which to me tells me they probably haven't. And they're just blindly repeating this, this dumb Muslim argument over and over and over again because they can't think because they don't actually know what First Timothy 2 is says. All they can do is keep saying, well, it says that it's it's tied to Eve. So therefore it must be only ab or I mean it must be about all women in all circumstances for all time. Do you know what an argument is, Kexi? 
<laughs> I don't think he does. I mean, like, I, I, can he find one, one church father, even among the, the folks who are heretics and weren't saying it, right? Find one person who said that women should never have authority over men. Because women had authority over men all the time, every day. Mothers had authority over their sons all the time, every day. And mistresses had authority over all of the, the people under their direction, whether they were paid laborers or slaves or whatever else. Empresses had authority. Like, this was never a question. Never a question. Now, of course, in Islam, no woman can have any authority whatsoever. But they always had authority. They always had authority. Um, you were supposed to treat all older women like your own mother. So that means that you show them the respect and the deference of a mother. Which means that young men would submit themselves to older women in certain contexts. And that would be expected. Because you are to honor the older women in the church as you do your mother. Yeah. So... Actually, I wanted to bring this back up here. Um, eh, that's not the right one. One of them that it says that First Timothy two ends with with talking about uh, the this as punishment. Kexi, were you paying attention? The Bible, the the chapter and number, the the chapter and verse numbering is completely and totally meaningless. It was added in what, like the the fifteenth century or something like that. Uh, as a convenience for people Maybe to reference. Maybe 16th, yeah. Yeah, somewhere around there. I don't remember the exact date, but, you know, more than a thousand years for sure, after the time it was written. First Timothy 3, one is the the very ver the next verse after the one that, that you're saying that it ends with, and it, it's continuing the same letter, the same thought. Uh, the comment that I just had up there a second ago pointed out that the entire letter is about church order. And indeed it is. It, it is Paul writing to Timothy on how he should organize the church. Timothy is being raised up as a leader. He's being raised up as, uh, you know, an authority figure who has, you know, we don't believe in like a, a top-down hierarchical structure, but, you know, he has a, an important role. And he's being given instructions by his mentor, Paul, on how to deal with the church. So when 3.1 says these are the qualifications for overseers or elders, uh, you know, it's the same word can be translated either way, it's connected. It's directly connected. So Paul makes an argument as to why this is the case, saying that it's connected to, to uh, childbirth and Eve. Um, theologians don't actually quite understand what point he was trying to make. It's one of the verses that people, that theologians who have no interest in, in you know, saying that, the, oh, elevating the status of women or whatever, they just say it, it's really hard to understand because it's, you know, it, it's a weird thing for him to say. But regardless of why he says that, he, he's giving that as the reason for why they have to be silent. But it doesn't mean that it's for all women at all time. It's just that they don't have this particular role. Women don't have this particular role because it's connected to the fall in some sense. But that in no way makes it, it, it general. You're not making a valid argument. No, no. And uh, again, Acts eighteen twenty six says that they began to speak, he began, this is Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Pris, Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Priscilla is the first one doing the explaining. She's teaching Apollos. So she took him aside and explained more accurately. Priscilla is always mentioned first, which is unusual, which indicates that she had more of a role because normally you would have it the opposite way. So he was instructed, he was corrected gently and instructed more fully, and he taught better after that point. By who? Priscilla, uh, along with Achilla. Now we go to, uh, what is it? Uh, Romans 16, 
three, greet Priscilla and Achilla, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, whom I not only give thanks, but also to all the churches of the Gentiles. So Paul is saying that they are fellow workers in Christ, that she is an evangelist. She's being called an evangelist. So Kexi, if your mom let you eat paint chips, then I'm sorry, you're just not going to understand. But either you are incredibly disabled or you are just being willful at this point. You have to read the entire thing. You're saying that Paul did not understand what he was saying. So you can come here and explain how Paul doesn't understand. And the thing is, this is what Muslims always do. They always run and go, oh, 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 women shouldn't be saying this because they can't argue with me. Because they know I'm right. They cannot argue about what I say, so they want to argue about who I am. You can come and try to correct me. First of all, if you submit yourself to Christ and to the gospel. So, yeah, Kexi, if you did not even understand save through childbearing, then you didn't understand anything. That is the stupidest thing I think you have written yet. Because what Paul is alluding to there is what happened with Eve... Adam and Eve, when the fall, when the snake was cursed, that was also a prophecy of the coming of Christ. And the second Eve, who is Mary, fulfilled that and brought us all salvation. So it is drawing a comparison between the ordinary work of a mother and the extraordinary work of God, which you, who used the ordinary work of womanhood and of a mother to bring himself into the incarnation and is saying that, look, women's roles are so important that this is how Christ came into the world, that you don't need to like shout because again, people are actually shouting and fighting in the middle of the service here. The men were shouting in anger before and raising their voices and here the women were quarreling with their husbands and with other men in the middle of the service. You don't need to do that. Your role is incredibly important. It is raising up the status of women. You can go ahead and pretend that Paul misunderstood what he said a paragraph before, but it just makes you look incredibly foolish. It makes you look intensely, incredibly foolish to say that Paul just didn't understand what he was writing and really he meant something else. So uh, this is just foolishness. If you want to talk about something else, you can. But yes. women have always been evangelists. A uh, woman converted the entire country of Georgia, as I mentioned before, and women were responsible for, a uh, woman was responsible for the conversion of the Roman Empire to embracing Christianity because it was her influence that had Constantine eventually go, okay, fine, God of my mother, give me a sign. And then God did. It was his mother who caused the conversion. All of these things work through women just as God came into the world through a woman and God revealed himself first to women uh, in the resurrection so women's roles are not to be shut away, locked away, whatever else. We are to model the pattern of the family of God. So within a marriage, we have the role of the bride of Christ, the church, and the husband has the role of Christ himself. Yeah, we have excellent. different roles. And but that does not mean that oh oh women they are to be uh, beaten as Islam has you know <laughs> like really no Christ suffered lashes for the sake of the church men are supposed to die for their wives they're not mm -hmm. supposed to beat them mm -hmm. like Islam so you can go ahead and pretend that you're okay slapping around your wife and watching your your father slap your mother around because you misunderstand Paul. But that doesn't make you right. If you want to actually talk to me about things that make any sense whatsoever and and leave aside your ridiculous misunderstanding, we can. But if you don't, then we, we're not even having a conversation. You're like, you can't talk to me. Yes, you're defeating everything I say, but you shouldn't be saying anything because I'm determined to misunderstand something. Ah. 
So, so Chris Kloss just said, good try, Reason Answers. You almost got in there. But uh, j just to sum up this, and we'll move on to a new point. Um, Kexi has asserted that these viruses are extremely clear and that we are just denying them. The problem for Kexi is that no one in the early church interpreted it the way they want to interpret it. The Apostle Paul uh, didn't interpret it that way because he gives various instructions and clues that would contradict that understanding of it. The author of Acts did not understand it that way, as you've pointed out. And Kexi won't even answer the question about whether they've actually read First Timothy, because we know the answer. They have not. They have not read the book. They're just repeating a argument that they've heard and asserting over and over again that it's perfectly clear with no evidence whatsoever. And that is that. Yeah, I mean, again, their clarity means that Paul didn't understand what he was writing. Exactly. So, uh, uh, Kexi continues, in other words, New Age Christians, which is apparently is us, claim that Paul's <laughs> letters only apply to those that it was written to and everyone else doesn't need to follow. That's not what no. we said at all, Kexi. Whatever this is saying, and we can debate what the exact meaning of it is, we agree 100% that it applies today. What we're saying is that if it's written about how to conduct church, then that's what it applies to, is how to conduct church. You can't just take something that says, during church services, women shouldn't be the, the head pastor, if you want to interpret it that way in modern terms. And again, like I said, you can have slightly different interpretations because the ancient terms for the offices of the church don't necessarily match up to our modern conceptions. So people can slightly disagree. But whatever it's saying, it's saying it about church services. And as we know, women are not allowed to be ministers in any sense in, in Islam. So why do you even have a problem with this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because your religion denigrates women, and you're desperately trying to deflect from that by making up something about the Bible and thinking that somehow justifies Islam. Let's pretend that you are right. You know, against all of the evidence, all of the, the early understanding of this text. You know, people who actually knew Koine Greek and how they understood the text, how the church was actually administered, what Bible scholars today who read the text and have expertise in the original languages and the history of the church say about it. Let's just pretend that all of them are right and you're wrong. That still does absolutely nothing to excuse your religion's disgusting, horrible treatment of women. So just give up on this point. It is never going to help you. It is not going to save your Islamic faith. So we're going to move on now. So Kexi says Islam is based on logic and God signs, which Christians lack. They still don't understand God created good and evil, Satan and angels. Well, thank you for admitting that the, the God of Islam creates evil. Indeed, he teaches that if people did not disobey him, he would destroy those people and create a new people who would disobey him so that he could show his mercy. What a wonderful God you serve. What a logical God you serve. Mary, how would you like to continue? It's just very, very, very ridiculous. So it, it's kind of funny that um, one of the, he actually did bring up one interesting thing, is that there is a creedal confession of Islam that's early. And one of the things that you're, you have to, and this one is a Gnostic one, which is hilarious, because I don't think Muhammad knew that it was Gnostic. Again, like he was constantly teaching things that he didn't understand. And one of the things that they explicitly have to confess that they believe in is angels. And that's because in some of the Gnostic systems, angels had specific roles, and also Sadducees uh, denied them. So, uh, no, uh, Elhud, what I was saying is that whenever you copy-pasted uh, from the from 434, oh, I didn't mean you. Uh, sorry, that was Joe Chris. Uh, I, 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 we've been talking past each other this whole time because I thought that for some reason I thought that you're the one who copy pasted that. Uh, 
uh, Joe Chris put uh, 434. And if you sense ill conduct from your women, advise them first. That first is not there. If they persist, is not there. Do not shoot. And leave them in their beds is what it actually says. And, and there is no, but if they still persist, that isn't there, then discipline them. So, uh, yes, actually, Allah is the author of evil, according to um, the Islamic doctrine that I was going to get into. Among the things that you have to affirm is a belief in Al-Qadr, which is fate, which is that the first thing that Allah created um, was the uh, first thing that Allah created was uh, that uh, the the pen, apparently he already had his throne and his throne was on the waters before creation. Uh, it's rather embarrassing, but Allah doesn't actually create his throne or the waters in a lot of the Islamic sources. But anyway, he created a pen and he ordered the pen to write. And everything that was written at that moment was what would happen. So everything, every evil that ever happened is what Allah has decreed. And Al-Qadr means fate. It does not mean like his foreknowledge. So Allah has specifically said what everything's going to do. So uh, yeah, we were talking against each other, uh, Al-Hud. Yes, whenever it says, go therefore make disciples of all nations. Yes, that is talking about women making disciples in the Great Commission also applies to women. As I uh, mentioned before, uh, women have always been evangelists and they have always had a role, an evangelistic role in the ancient church. Uh, they were companion, they were fellow workers of Paul, and they were uh, early. Uh, many were early martyrs. Many, many martyrs. Many converted any other people. Um, so, yeah. Uh, somewhat humorous, but also valid question from Chris Claus here. Islam is so dumb. Um, um, <laughs> why did God need a pen to write? Right. Would he need to write something? Was he going Ooh, to forget it? Good, good question. This is great. Yeah. It's 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 part of the accidental Gnosticism, the oopsie Gnosticism. So uh, the Gnostic beliefs had a lot of these divine books that are handed down or revealed from God, and it was kind of riffing off the Torah because what the Jews did when Jesus came and was revealed as the Word. They took their Mimra and Logos theology, their Debar theology, about the Word who was God and with God and somehow was distinct at the same time from God and just reinterpreted that as being the Torah. So one of the things that they said is in Genesis 1.26, whenever God says, let's make mankind in our image, he was talking to the Torah according to some of the i'm serious so they just made the torah the logos right and so like they have god talking to the torah at various points and having this pre-existent torah and then this got like incorporated into gnosticism and reinterpreted again and so this this companion book that is with god and is the word of god and so is kind of god but distinct from god to it got incorporated in the Quran, and actually, in one of the ahadith, guess where the the uh, where this eternal decree is? Take a wild guess as to where it would be. Uh, the Talmud. Well, no, no, like that. The Quran, <laughs> where it would be in relationship to Allah. So oh, Allah uh, is on the throne. So guess right, where? So, so guess where him. it is? Written above him, so he can see it. Well, no, it's it's actually on the throne with him. So you so have sitting on it. <laughs> uh, well, it's well. See, the thing is, in it is the Lamb and the Father are on the throne together in uh, in Revelation. They just swapped out the Lamb for the book, which is the placement of the Logos, which is the will instead of the Logos, the decree instead of the Logos, right? So all of that, all of that stuff. That's how that all happened. It was very, very, very funny. So uh, Kexi has more or less agreed with you um, that Allah created evil and good, and, but then he contradicts himself, saying that he gave free will to humans to choose between those two, saying that human beings have the capacity to be good, even though he later said that Allah designed Adam and Eve to sin. Can God create man and woman to God could create 
men and women to not sin, but he chose not to do that. Uh, Kexi, I want you to think about your claims here. Um, you're claiming that the God you follow, which you believe is a good God, uh, something worth following, could have designed human beings to not sin and instead designed them to sin. How does that make your God good? I want you to answer that. Please answer in the chat how your God is good or, or flat out say that your God isn't good um, in the absolute sense. That's fine. If that's where you want to go, that would at least be logically consistent. But if you're going to claim that Allah is good, then why in the world would Allah create human beings to sin when he could have created them to not sin? Well, uh, I have a question. So, according to him, they didn't have to sin. What would happen if Adam did not sin? What would have happened to him according to the Ahadith? Can, can you tell me there, Kexi? We'll, so, we'll give them it, a, it's a, a yeah, it's a fifteen. Yeah, it's a fifteen-second delay. So yeah, um, yeah it'll we'll take us for re reply. But uh, they made a couple more comments along the same line. Who managed to corrupt God's creation? Who has such power to change God's creation? Um, and j just to pick this one up again, that God created good and evil. And I didn't save it, but one was like basically, uh, how could evil exist if God? <laughs> Oh my gosh, Kexi actually took one of my major attacks against Islam and said, yep, that's true. Allah created the world like a game. You are inside a game which has physical limits in which different choices. You are the avatar that plays the game and can choose how to play the game, can either choose good, evil, or good. Now, part of this is true. In fact, there is no good and evil. It is just this dirty game that Allah just declares what you're supposed to do, and that becomes good, and what you're not supposed to do, and that becomes evil, and it has no meaning. It's a stupid game. However, he is utterly and completely incorrect whenever he says that you get to choose. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's look at what, uh, there are tons and tons of versions of this ahadith. It says, Adam and Moses argued with each other. Moses said to Adam, you are Adam whose mistake expelled you from paradise. Adam said to him, you are Moses whom Allah selected as his messenger and the one to whom he spoke directly. Yet you blame me for a thing which had already been written in my fate before my creation. My fate, my al qadr right? So thank you for, for showing how much you do not know about Islam and what was taught about the fall of man. It is what was written in his fate for him to do. He must do it because nothing that was not written is something that he wouldn't do. You can say that, oh yeah, he had free will. No, he didn't. Because why do you blame me for a thing which had already been written in my fate? So according to this, you are not blamable blameworthy for something that is written in your fate. My question to you, Kexi, is what things do you do are not written in your fate according to Islam? If that is a valid defense, and at the end it says, so Adam overpowered Moses. That's the final sentence here. So Adam overpowered Moses. Adam won. He has the correct understanding. He is not blameworthy because it was written in his fate. Yeah, so Kexi, you're not answering the question. So answer the question, how are you responsible for what you do if Adam was not responsible because it had been written in his fate? How can you blame me for what was written in my fate? You cannot blame me for that. Adam overpowered Moses. His argument was correct. So what deeds that you do are not written in your fate and therefore you are actually responsible? Yeah, it, it, Kexi needs to start actually responding to our questions or we're going to end this lack of conversation uh, very shortly because Kexi is just repeating themselves over and over again, saying the same exact words, sometimes copying and pasting it. We, we got it. Well, first of all, thank you for being honest. Thank you for telling us that Allah is responsible for evil and that he had other options. He just chose to create evil because, hey, why not? Yeah, you know, why not? Why, why would the all good God of the universe not 
choose to create evil. So give us some answers. Tell us why your God created evil. Tell us why you, you or tell us if your God is good or not. Tell us if you're responsible for your actions. Telling us that we lack logic is not an answer. Answer the questions or we're going to wrap up this stream. But thank you for asking who created evil. Who created evil indeed? What is the Christian understanding of evil, Mary? Do we believe that evil is an object, uh, a real thing that exists in, in reality, that has substance that you can, in, you know, just talk about as its own independent thing that needs to be created? Or do we have a different view of what evil means? We absolutely do not believe that evil is existent or evil was created. Evil is solely a deprivation of good. That's it. Exactly. This is an actual answer, Kexi. You, I, you presumably think your God is good, even though you won't actually tell us that. Um, but then you assert that your God created evil. Okay. You know what evil actually is? Evil is the absence of good or the perversion of good. It's anything that's not the way it's supposed to be. So who created evil? Well, e no one created evil, but who caused evil to come into the wor world? Human beings caused evil to come into the world by cho freely choosing to disobey God. No, and someone said that that's a C.S. Lewis definition of evil, but it's, it's much older than that. Like Athanasius had a really long, I don't know who, other people might have mentioned it earlier than Athanasius, but he had a really long explanation and saying that those folks who said that evil has substance are all deluded. They're, they are themselves uh, in rebellion from God to claim that. So... No, this is this is not you know this is not just a recent thing. This is the way it's always been understood that evil is not a creation. Evil is the deprivation of good. So no, no, Kexi, evil is not a creation. So for you, Allah is evil. All evil, all evil comes from Allah. So mm -hmm. yes, Allah mm -hmm. is evil. Allah has written for you your uh, zina. He has decreed for you every evil act that you will ever do has been written by the pen before your souls were pulled out of the back of Adam and were commanded to uh, tell Allah that you will abide by how he's created you, right? So yes, for you, evil has substance and is a creation and it comes from Allah. So yeah, that is very telling. Yeah, I mean, uh, th thank you, for Kexi, for being honest about what Islam teaches. But you need to stop and think. You need to stop and think about what you're telling us here. You're telling us that your God created evil. Tell us why you think that your God created evil. Maybe you think that your God is just arbitrary and, and stupid and just does random things. Well, we agree with that. Um, and, and continuing to ask us, uh, you know, why do Christians get cancer or... Uh, who created cancer, is just a distraction. Uh, we have answers for, for why so-called natural evil exists, but they're irrelevant because you don't even understand what evil means. And who created Satan? Well, Satan is a fallen angel. God created the angels. Satan was not created to be evil. He used his free will to rebel against God, same as human beings. Your version of reality is not logical. It doesn't make any sense. You're in here telling us that we don't have any logic, yet you can't answer any of our questions. Again, why did your God create evil? You assert that evil is a real thing that God did not have to create. So why did Allah create evil? Does that not make him evil? That's what you're telling us when you say that and that he created evil. And no, this is also inaccurate. You say, I guess God did not know that Satan will become evil and corrupt humanity. God made the mistake and did not know the future. <laughs> you, you, so you he, not... he again thinks that if, if God does not make people do things, then God can't know it. Like, I know I can 
have absolute certainty that when I send my child outside to ride, to learn to ride a bike, it's going to fall down and get scraped up. Even with my limited human understanding, I can understand that in learning to ride a bike, my child will get hurt. Okay? How much more could God know? I'm not making my child fall down. The fact that I don't stop my child from doing that does not mean that I have done the same thing as if I hurt my child in that way. So it's just, it's, it's nonsensical. He's like reverting to open theism. Oh, if God doesn't make it happen, he couldn't know. I don't think Kexi has really said anything of any significance. Um, let's just go ahead and put these positions up here anyway. Um, yes, God is behind good and bad. God gave you choice between the two as a test, blah, blah, blah. Again, you're just repeating yourself. I asked you why, not what God did according to you. We got, we got your position. Can you please explain to us why a God who would do this is worth following? As to Moses' dust in the grave, don't know what that's supposed to mean. But yes, Moses' body decayed just like every other human being's body did and his soul lived on just like every other human being's soul lived on so i have no clue what that is about uh this is why atheists don't take christians seriously because they understand god created everything including evil only christians live in fantasy where they believe evil is some random thing so kexi if you think that atheists believe that god created evil i don't even know how to talk to you because that is utter nonsense. Atheists generally would assert that evil doesn't exist at all, or if they did assert that it exists, they would assert it as a moral principle, not something tangible that needs to be created. So I have no clue where you're getting this nonsense from, but I suggest that you start investigating things, and most importantly, you start thinking 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 if you are actually thinking you can answer my questions because they're very natural out outpouring of your position you say that god created evil i ask you why would god create evil you assert that human beings have the uh, that he could have created human beings who were as impossible for them to sin and that he chose to do otherwise i ask you why you don't answer me I ask you why this God is worth following. You don't answer me. I ask you why you think this is logical. You don't answer me. So please, please, please start thinking. Uh, I'll close out with an answer to this question, who created sin? But before I do, Mary, do you have any last thoughts you want to share with Kexi? Uh, not really. He. It's so funny because he makes Allah into the exact thing that I keep saying that Allah is that he is this, you know, psychopathic evil deity who is, who just makes up random rules and call, and whatever rules he makes, those are good. That's what good becomes. Just his rules. It is the game. You play the game, you get the reward at the end. And the game itself, its rules are the only good that exists. And at the end, as a reward, you get all the stuff that was previously called evil. Like, heaven's sake, who created sin. Yeah, I mean, like, for him, that's that's what Allah does. So, uh, let's see. There's some... Oh, let, let me find the one that talks about the, the faith believing in decree and not denying it. And how... There, there is uh, an actual question here about, tell me about faith. Faith is believing in uh, Allah and the last day and the angels. And then he also says that, like, well, if Allah has decreed anything, how are you responsible for it? And then the response was to that question. I wish that we had Phil here. He'd be able to find it really fast. He, um, he says that uh uh that if you um nope i can't find it easily anyway uh 
that you have to believe in it's bad and it's good, right? So how are you responsible for what you do according to fate in this hadith? And then the response to that is, well, I, I don't know, that makes me uncomfortable, but I still have to affirm faith. And then the response to that is, oh, well, I was just testing you, haha. -ha. So otherwise they have no real answer for that in the ancient sources. The idea that somehow you really can be responsible for what was ordained for you to do, that you must do, that you had no choice, that you were created to do and nothing else, that you're still responsible for that, that was something that did become part of the, uh, you know, of the creed of, for example, the, uh, the, uh, standard Sunni narrative, but it doesn't fit with the original sources. And the funny thing is, is that the uh, Metezolites actually just completely rejected all of this fate because it made no sense. They're just like, no, no, that part's just wrong. That's just wrong. So you can, you can make comments about the Hadith and try to reconcile it to the system that they created to try to make sense of the many crazy things that Muhammad said. But that doesn't change what Muhammad really taught. It doesn't change the, the incredibly inconsistent things that he taught, among which were that Allah ordains for you certain evil deeds, and that Adam could not be considered to be responsible for the evil deed he committed because it was ordained by Allah. Like, yes, of course, people are going to make excuses for this, but they, they really can't. And again, this was another thing. As Lloyd says, this is another fundamentally gnostic belief the the belief in this fate was something that every gnostic group affirmed and at the time that every christian except for augustine who tried to make a thing of it and then was later rebuked said that no no this is not right this is not how you are to understand this um you know that, that there's no that free choice is fundamental and in fact the early uh, Muslims pointed out that this was a fundamental difference between Islam and both Christianity and Judaism is if anyone starts saying that you start having free will and that you can choose otherwise or you can just choose you can choose you can truly choose that that would make you a Christian or a Jew and so these later attempts to reconcile things are, are fairly late after the initial rebuke of the Metezolites they still got kind of uncomfortable with the conclusions and and try to make things make sense and go together, but they really don't. Absolutely. So we have a couple of atheists in the chat here we, who have confirmed that I correctly stated the typical atheist position. I'm not asserting that it's universal, but that uh, Andrew Martin, I'm an atheist. Evil doesn't exist. It's simply the absence of good as per Christian views. All of creating evil shows that Satan is lazy. And he further explained, you can point to a shadow and say that dark exists, like you can point to the absence of good and say that's a sin or evil. Shadow, absent of light, evil, absence of good. Likewise, Thor says, I'm an atheist, and I asked him if evil exists, and he said, I don't think so. Doesn't exist as a material thing. This is a Muslim position, not an atheist position, not a Christian position, Stop asserting that other people agree with your position, and especially stop asserting that it's logical when you are unwilling to provide any evidence whatsoever that it's logical. We do have one last comment from Kexi before I close out with his question about sin. God in the Bible says he designed prophets while they're in the womb. And then he quotes us uh, Jeremiah 11 which had the follow-up question. Uh, I know he's talking about Jeremiah, but example how God decided fate before you're born. So how, you're, you're making a logical leap here, Kexing. Designing someone does not mean des deciding their fate. It does not making th mean making them into a robot who has no free will. You're making a terrible logical leap and taking the ass assertion that God has designed human beings, specifically in his image, if we want to go with the whole biblical narrative, that God has created human beings in a specific way, and asserting that that's the same thing as fate, which is interesting because you can't even decide whether Islam teaches free will or it teaches fatalism. Any thoughts on that, Mary? 
No, I think you summed it up really well. All right. So I wanted to close out with the, this question of who created sin? So, Kexi, I hope you listen. I, I, I really hope you take what I'm about to say. You take it into consideration. You think about the logic of your position. Think about the God that you claim that you serve. The God that you assert created evil. The God that the Quran asserts had to create people who would disobey him or else he couldn't exercise his mercy, that he was deficient without creating evil. Think about whether that's a picture of God that actually makes sense. So, who created sin? Well, in the biblical narrative, there's a perfectly logical explanation for the origin of sin. It's not a creation like evil. Sin is not a material thing that you can point to and say, that thing exists independently of people. That, that's what we mean when, when we say that evil isn't a thing. You can't point to evil and say evil exists independently of things, in, independently of objects. So what caused sin? Well, it, it's pretty simple, actually. So God creates human beings in his own image. He creates us with capacities, abilities beyond what he creates with animals. It's a very deep theological topic. I'm not going to touch on it in great detail. But among other things, this includes the ability to think, the ability to reason, and yes, the ability to freely decide for ourselves what to do. So God creates human beings with the capacity to sin. He does not force them to sin. He does not force them not to sin. He creates human beings with the capacity for sin. The story of Adam and Eve. In the biblical narrative, this story has a very important purpose. Unlike in Islam, where it's just kind of there for no reason. The purpose of the story of Adam and Eve, it's not really ultimately about two people. It's about human beings. It reflects upon our own nature. That human beings, when given the temptation to sin, will sometimes resist but will also sometimes fall into the temptation. They will choo freely choose to do things that they know are evil. Now you might ask, why did God allow this? That's because free will is necessary for something. It is necessary for the capacity to love. One cannot love without the ability to exercise free will. And the ability to love is far greater a far greater good than the sin that is caused in the world by the also giving free will. The two go one in one. The ability to sin and the ability to love go hand in hand. They both are, they both require free will in order to do. You cannot actually love in the understanding of what Christians mean by love. And I know that Islam doesn't really understand what love is. They just use it as a synonym for sex. But in the, in the Christian understanding of love, this self-sacrificial giving of oneself to another voluntarily is only a possible by necessity of the word voluntarily in that definition with the existence of free will. So God creates us with free will. He knows that we will sin, but he also knows that he has a solution for the sin problem. He has to create us with free will if he wants us to love. And this is what God actually wants. He wants love. God is love. God is a, a being that is an outpouring of love. And, and because of his outpouring, not because of anything that he is deficient, not because he needs anything from human beings, but because of his nature, because of his outpouring for love, he desires to create human beings with the capacity to love so that they can live in an eternal relationship with him. But of course we fall. And the, the entire story of the biblical narrative begins with the fall, the fall continues, and then starting with the call of Abraham. Again, everything in the biblical narrative has a purpose, unlike in Islam, where stories are just there for the heck of it. Beginning with the call of Abraham, the restoration begins. God goes through numerous 
ideas of how human beings would say this is how you would solve this problem you know the the flood for example getting rid of all the evil human beings that that's a very human thing to do calling a a, a special prophet working great miracles that no one could possibly deny and so on and so forth and we see that these things work for a little while that they they work for you know a minute but the very people who saw the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, for instance, saw God's presence in a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. When Moses disappeared for 40 days, they abandoned God. And not all of them, you know, just a percentage, but uh, people who had seen undeniable proof that their God was real and working in their lives, they still fell away from God at the at the slightest temptation you know Moses was missing he shouldn't have gone up to the mountain and tempted God so they say why don't we we make ourselves uh, God uh, let's take all of our our jewelry you know the the one thing of value that we material value that we have that we're able to take out of Israel and melt it down and make ourselves a God this is the nature of human beings and this is the story of the of the biblical narrative over and over again god calls people back and they're they're back for a little while and then they fall away again and then you god uses the exile and they they fall away and then he brings them back and they rebuild the temple and so on and so forth over and over again demonstrating that humans ideas of how to solve the sin problem will never work it doesn't matter how many laws God gives, human beings will still violate them. It doesn't matter how much he demonstrates his uh, loving hand in our lives, we'll still rebel against him. We need a real solution. We need a savior. We need someone who is perfect. We need someone who can atone for our sin, actually make up for it, not just cover it over and pretend it doesn't exist like the God of Allah does, or, you know, arbitrarily puts them on Jews and Christians for no apparent reason because someone happened to be a Muslim, um, but actually exercise both judgment, punish sin, and mercy, forgive sin. How does he do that? He does that by becoming incarnate, entering into creation, lowering himself to become one of us. Muslims argue that, that, the, the, that God is so other, that he's so above us, that he can't enter into creation. That's because your God is deficient. That is because your God lacks an ability, and he lacks the love necessary to do this. It is, in a sense, degrading to God's nature to enter in creation. You're right about that. But it's not ultimately degrading because it exhibits something that is far more important. It exhibits his love for humanity. It exhibits his love for us. So he enters into creation. He lives the perfect life. He does what the human, um, or sorry, he does what the laws showed us that we couldn't do on our own. He fulfills all the laws. He fulfills all the requirements of being righteous. And then he says, I chose to create you. I knew you would sin. I chose to create you anyway. In some sense, I bear responsibility. Now, does he bear ultimate responsibility? Of course not. We had free will. We could have resisted sin. We chose not to do so. But he bears, he says, I love you enough to say that I bear some of the responsibility. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take all your sins upon myself. And I'm going to punish them, to destroy them on the cross once and for all. I'm going to exert my full wrath upon myself on the cross. I will take all your sins and I will destroy them once and for all. And all you have to do is give me what I want from the beginning, a relationship with you. And when the Christian or the, the person who is about to become a Christian accepts Jesus as their Savior, they receive full forgiveness for all their sins, past, present, and future. Because God is outside of time. His once and for all sacrifice transcends time. But that's only half the equation. That's not all we get. We also get God's imputed righteousness on us. When he looks at us, he sees Jesus. He sees perfection. He sees what we were designed to be 
not what we are. And because of that, we are able to have an eternal relationship with him. God cannot be in the presence of sin. He cannot tolerate sin in his presence. He must destroy it. He must destroy evil because he is a good God, because he is completely and totally good. He must destroy all sin. And he did on the cross. And then when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. And we're judged according to Jesus, not according to our own good deeds, not according to our, our acts, not according to what Islam actually teaches. If you take the source of Syria, which is just completely arbitrary, he just decrees some people are saved and others are not. But he exerts full and perfect mercy and full and perfect justice at the same time on the cross. And we get to be part of God's family, adopted into his eternal family, and spend our eternal lives in his presence as a result of what he and he alone did. This is the gospel message. I hope you take it into consideration and realize that this is much better than what your so-called God has to offer. Any last thoughts from you, Mary? Um, not too much. There's just some craziness in the uh, chat. Allah creates sin and made humans to sin, so humans turn to God. So again, God can create a human that does not sin, but there's no fun in that, Kexi says. Like, does he have any idea what a psychotic, <laughs> evil creature his Allah is? Like, because Allah wants to indulge his own characteristic of mercy, which would not exist, if, if he did not cause people to sin, then he uses his characteristic of making people to sin, sin, and then he forgives whom he wills and doesn't forgive those whom he wills, and he deceives whom he wills, and he doesn't deceive, and he uh, leads a right to those whom he wills. There's, there's nothing in the Quran about Allah being obligated to guide correctly those who truly seek him. Allah puts no obligations on himself that sincerity would lead to being rightly guided. There is no way for you to guarantee that you will be rightly guided by your desires, actions, beliefs, sincere, you know, your sincere hope, your prayers. None of that can guarantee that you will be rightly guided. Allah leads astray whom he wills, he guides aright whom he wills, and you're, you're created for one or the other. So, there are, yeah, there are contradictions in the Quran because it's about Muhammad not taking responsibility for any of his actions. So Muhammad, a lot of times, Muhammad's own uncle rejected him and his crackpot beliefs as he was dying. His beloved uncle, um, Abu Talib, the father of Ali, um, he, he rejected his, his crackpot system. And Muhammad had to come up with the idea that Allah, even though Abu Talib was like a good man, right? He was a good man. He protected Muhammad. He's the only reason Muhammad survived because Abu Talib was like, look, I know that he's causing problems, but I've always protected him. You know, I've always cared for him. We should be kind to him. And he shielded him and protected him and kept him from harm. Did not accept Islam is now in the hellfire forever. Why? Not because he was someone who was insincere, not because he was an evil man, but because Allah chose to create him for hellfire. You have to look at the entire picture, not just go, well, there's this one verse in the Quran that affirms that you choose. You have to look at the entire picture story that Muhammad was presenting and the excuses for the things that he was saying for why people ended up in the hellfire and why they ended up in paradise. Uh, yeah, guess what? One day he'd wake up in a really depressed mood and he'd just be go, you can't say where I will end up or where you will end up or where anyone will end up. I have no idea what will become of me. Allah has made no promises concerning me. And then another day he'd say, well, lady having a fever, as long as as you don't ask me to pray to Allah to cure your fever, Allah will grant you paradise. It's just how Muhammad was, constantly. 
constantly. No, I do not have cultural issues with Islam. I have decency issues and <laughs> logical issues. And I have issues with a dude who goes into a cave. And if you are in an ancient society, you know that the reason you go into caves is to contact infernal deities. You go there to talk to gods that live below the ground. Okay? They live down. So you go to mountaintop to try to talk to a god who is conceptually in heaven. You go into a cave to talk to god under the ground. And while he was there, he had a vision and got squeezed by something that he sincerely believed was a demon. Came out running and screaming that he's been attacked by a demon. And his wife convinced him that that was an angel. So go and show me any other prophet who mistook an angel for a demon and we can start to have some sort of conversation about how much sense it makes to believe that Muhammad is a messenger of God. And then once we do that, we can look at the claims of the Quran and what it says about, about uh, the previous prophets and what they taught, what it says about the scriptures the Jews and Christians have with them then. And whether or not it's consistent. No, I would make a terrible Muslim. I only make good arguments because I'm a Christian. If I were a Muslim, I could not make arguments because it makes no sense. Like, you know, uh, there are all these Muslims who are constantly trying, oh, you should convert, you should convert, you'd make, no, I'd make terrible arguments. I am not, I have actually never been in a formal debate before. I talk to people, I argue with people, I'm going to be in a formal debate, uh, like, I think next week and hopefully if nothing terrible goes wrong but I can talk this way just because it makes sense just because it's understandable I would not want to be in the position of defending Islam because it's just incoherent you can't wrap your mind around it it's insane so no I'd make a terrible Muslim because it makes no sense and if I actually did believe it I'd go off and be an ISIS jihadi wife or something like that if I were suddenly deluded enough because when I read the Quran when I read the Tafsir, if I am to say Sunni Islam it has these things, these things are true, that's where you'd end up. So, yes, I am absolutely serious that it doesn't make any sense. I, I am very serious about that. Uh, all the claims, all the things he said about the, the stuff we have with us, the fact that he quotes from the Talmud and thinks he's quoting from the Torah, the fact that he quotes from other random like he doesn't even know what he's quoting from he thinks that uh uh alexander the great is a good muslim and quotes from basically the best-selling novel of the ancient world muhammad sticks the plot right into the quran and thinks it really happened so yes all of these things i am very serious about all of these things are in the quran he's quoting from fictional sources no i'd make a terrible muslim it makes no sense I could not defend it. I like how you say, I just have a couple brief points and then you go over 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm sorry. Well, I was still engaging with the, the No, 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 no. But... You're, you're fine. I'm, I'm not complaining. I, I just thought it was funny. So we're, we're going to close out on this from Kexi. I told you Allah created humans to worship God. That is explained in Islam. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kexi. Once again. Well, oh, it's even better. No, no, it's better. It's better. The only thing that humans and jinns were created to do, according to the Quran, they were created to do nothing except worship Allah. The only purpose for their creation was worshiping Allah. Why on earth was Adam created to sin then? Because he was created to sin. You know, that was in his, his fate. It was written in his fate to sin. And that if... If the sons of Adam didn't sin, then Allah would have destroyed them all and created men to sin. How on earth does sinning work with creating jinn and humans only, <laughs> only to worship Allah? Um, it, it, you know, the, the Arabic word there, it's for nothing except or only to or there, you know, this is the only thing. There's nothing outside of this that they were created for according to that passage. So, yeah, I, 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 that's one of my favorite uh, Quranic verses because it's so funny because of everything else. I'm like, then why everything else? 
Yeah, I mean, you just revealed yet another contradiction in Kexi's logic. You know, actually went a different way than I was going to go, but that's great because, uh, you know, Kexi's telling us that Allah created human beings to worship God. How does you also told us that Allah could have created human beings without the capacity to sin, which means that you just told us that Allah needs human beings to sin in order to worship Him. Think about what you're saying, Kexi. Think about how pathetic and terrible your picture of God is. I answered you about why Christians, what Christians think about why God created Adam. I told you that it's an outpouring of his love. Go back and review what I actually said. AKQ, do you want a robot wife who programmed you to say I love you? to you at set times or do you want someone who loves you of your own free will exactly love requires free will god created human beings to love not to worship him not to sin not to do whatever other nonsense you want but he created human beings to love as a natural outpouring of his own love not because he was deficient not because he needed human beings to worship him not because he needed human beings to sin so he could be merciful not that he created human beings because he needed someone to love him because he's self-sufficient in his triune nature he's loving from all eternity from before he created human beings he does not need to create it is a natural outpouring of his love the christian narrative is logical the christian narrative makes sense you can say you don't believe it. That's fine. But you cannot say that it is illogical and Islam makes sense because you couldn't answer any of our questions. Finally, from Ellie, why did God create Adam? God is all sufficient, so he didn't create Adam to meet some of his, some need of his own. All his needs are met. It's a natural outpouring of God's love not something he needs to do. He does not need human beings to worship him like Islam teaches. He does not need human beings to love him. And he certainly does not need human beings to sin. That is just such a horrible and distorted and gross picture of God. And it's what your God claims of himself in the Quran. These aren't my words. These are his words. If Human beings did not rebel against me. I would have destroyed that people and created a new people who would sin against me so that I could forgive them. He needs human beings to sin. Your God is pathetic. Your God is evil. Your God is the source of evil, according to you. So think about your God. Go back and review the gospel message I gave you and see which actually makes more sense. Thank you all for joining us today. I know this was an exceptionally long stream. Like I said before, I'll divide this into two chunks. Once YouTube processes, it, it'll probably be like, I don't know, 12 to 16 hours before they do. So, so don't expect that right away, but I'll eventually divide it up and put the Kexi chant in a, in a separate stream from the Jordan Peterson. Tomorrow I will have my usual Saturday Bible study. I may or may not have a stream on Sunday waiting for word on that. And then I think probably Monday I'll be releasing a scripted video looking at the hand of God, the hand of providence, working to prevent David from deleting his channel and ultimately give it to Hatoon instead of his original plan to delete it. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great week. Go and serve the Lord. God bless.